Now that we've talked about a price ceiling, let's come back and talk about a closely related concept, that of a price floor. As its name suggests, a price floor is in fact a legally mandated minimum price. So for example, we again represent a price floor as a horizontal line on our supply and demand diagram because it occurs at one particular price. But this time what we're saying is, for example, with this price floor here, the price of our item can only be this amount or higher. And with this price floor here, for example, we're saying that the legal prices available are only from this price up. Just like with price ceilings, we can have price floors that are either binding, meaning that they actually affect the market price and quantity of an item, or we can have a price floor that is non-binding, meaning for the time being, given the current market setup, that price floor is really not relevant in terms of equilibrium price and quantity. We can see why this is, because with this binding price floor up here, if we've excluded our free market equilibrium price and said that the lowest price that we could charge is this amount here, we've materially changed our market. Whereas if we put this price floor in place, we're saying, well, you can only charge prices this amount or above. Well, the market wanted to charge a price higher than that anyway, so this particular price floor doesn't affect the outcome for the time being. We can say in general with the price floor that our price floor is binding if we set it at a price that is greater than the free market equilibrium price. And our price floor is non-binding if we set it at a quantity that is less than or equal to the free market equilibrium price. Again, we should keep in mind that a price floor that is binding today could become non-binding tomorrow, and a price floor that's non-binding today could in fact be binding tomorrow. And the reason for this is that sometimes these price floors are put in as safeguards to keep the price of an item from becoming too low. And we could have changes in either supply or demand that would change this naturally occurring price, and the price floor could act as a safety against the price going too low. For example, this non-binding price floor could become relevant if we saw enough of an increase in supply or enough of a decrease in demand. Similarly, this binding price floor up here could become non-binding if there was enough of an increase in demand or enough of a decrease in supply. So let's examine what happens to the market when we put a binding price floor in place. The example of a price floor that I come upon most often is the fact that most states have a legally mandated minimum price for cigarettes. And that legally mandated minimum price is in fact a price floor. So as we go through this, you can think about this as what happens to the market for cigarettes when we put this price floor in place. So here we're looking at a binding price floor because the price floor is set at a price above the free market equilibrium price. And you'll notice here, just as we had with the price ceiling, that we're driving a wedge between the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied of our item. In this case, however, the roles of supply and demand are reversed because at this price that's higher than the equilibrium price, our quantity supplied which is where the supply curve meets the price floor, is greater than the quantity demanded, which is where the demand curve meets the price floor. We can say rather than generating a shortage as we had with the price ceiling, we instead have a surplus, which means, at least in a theoretical sense, we have extra of the item lying around because Suppliers want to supply more of the item. In other words, it's, more, it's profit maximizing given this price to supply this amount. Unfortunately, the suppliers won't be able to sell all of it because at this price, our demand is only at this point here. To understand what price and quantity are going to persist in a market with a binding price floor, we can just look at the graph to figure out what's going on. We can say here, when we have a binding price floor in place, 
the price is going to try to get as close to the original equilibrium price as possible. So it's going to bump up against this price floor, and we can say that our equilibrium price under the price floor situation is this P star sub PF that I've labeled here, which is really simple because it's just the price at which the price floor is set. On the quantity side, we can remember that it takes both a buyer and a seller to make a transaction happen. So in this case, our quantity demanded is the limiting factor. Because from these quantities, you know, from a quantity of zero up until this quantity here, we have both buyers and sellers. Once we go past this quantity demanded out here to the quantity supplied, we have producers being willing to produce at the given price, but we don't have any buyers ready to buy the product. So we can't have a transaction if we have supply and no demand. So the actual quantity transacted with this price floor is this Q star sub PF that I've labeled here. We can quantify the surplus here, or the excess quantity that suppliers want to supply at the given price above and beyond the demand that they're looking at, by the quantity supplied at the price floor price minus the quantity demanded at the price floor price. However, it's a little bit counterintuitive to think about because the word surplus means extra, when what's actually happening in this market is we're not getting anything extra, we're actually getting a reduction in the quantity transacted from the original free market outcome quantity Q star here to this Q star under the price floor here. So this surplus here is not an actual surplus. It's not like producers keep producing this amount and the, amount and the goods just go into inventory and in warehouses somewhere. The suppliers figure out, well, if I could get this price, it would be profit maximizing to produce this quantity but I know that the price is artificially high and I don't really have the demand to support that. So in reality, they figure out, well, maybe I shouldn't just keep making extra and having it stockpile somewhere. And they figure out to really only produce this amount here because that's all that they can sell. Now the complication here that's not shown in this model is it's unclear how companies figure out how to limit their supply. To go from here to here, we don't really know whether it's all of the existing companies that are all producing less individually, or if some companies are dropping out of the market, or what's really going on. That's sort of left ambiguous in this particular model here. But the important part to remember is that you're not really getting any sort of stockpile. You're just forcing producers to not produce as much as would be profit maximizing at this price if they could sell it off.